Gospel today from Luke chapter 4, and we're going to read the first 13 verses. This passage has to do with the temptation of Jesus. As you hear this passage read, I encourage you to notice how Jesus handled temptation. He is our perfect example. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So, if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. <coughs> Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. This is the gospel of our Lord. At the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. At that time, the Spirit of God descended on him in a bodily form as a dove. And a voice came from heaven, the very voice of his Father God, who said, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Immediately after that, the Spirit of God led Jesus into the desert, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Now the Bible makes a point of saying that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit when this happened. The Bible tells us that he was led by the Spirit into the desert where he was tempted by the devil. No one could ever be more full of the Holy Spirit than Jesus. Would you agree with me on that? Nobody could be more filled with the Holy Spirit than Jesus was. But I want you to notice that the filling of the Spirit did not prevent Jesus from being tempted. It is not a sin to be tempted. Giving in to that temptation to do wrong, that's the sin. Jesus was tempted, and yet he never, ever sinned. Not even once. Think about that. He never did one wrong thing in his life. He never did one thing that disappointed his heavenly Father. Now, we don't know all the details of what transpired during those 40 days in the wilderness, but we do know that as that period of time reached its climax, there was a series of three major temptations which are recorded in Scripture in some detail. First, it is helpful to realize that there are basically three different kinds of temptations that we may experience. And you will see as we look at the temptations of Jesus that he experienced all three of these. First of all, the devil said, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now Jesus had been without food for 40 days. The idea of something to eat must have been extremely tempting. Wouldn't you think? 
I want you to realize that these were real temptations. Sometimes we tend to think, well, you know, Jesus, he's the Son of God. Of course! He wasn't really tempted. But you know, if there had not been some appeal in the things that the devil offered, they wouldn't have been real temptations, would they? If he had no desire at all for the things that the devil said were available, they wouldn't be temptations. They were real temptations. The Bible teaches that. The devil begins by attempting to get Jesus to question his relationship with the Heavenly Father. What does he say? He says, if you are the Son of God. If you are. He wants to plant that little seed of doubt. That's how the devil often begins his work. By planting a seed of doubt. Way back at the beginning of the human story, he came to Eve in the Garden of Eden. And he said, Did God really say that you shouldn't eat the fruit of that tree? He planted a seed of doubt. Doubt is the enemy of belief. And belief is foundational to our relationship with God. Did you notice the scripture that was read earlier today? Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, where it says, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. The devil will tempt you to doubt your beliefs and to believe your doubts. Instead, what you want to do is doubt your doubts and believe your beliefs. What was Jesus' response when the devil attempted to plant a seed of doubt? He said, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. In Matthew's gospel, he gives the full quotation. It is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That is a quote from the Torah, from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Jesus was hungry. He could have performed a miracle by turning stone to bread, something to eat. But it is worth noting that Jesus never once performed miracles for his own comfort or convenience. Jesus was often hungry. Jesus was often tired. He did not perform miracles just to satisfy himself, but always to meet a human need and always for the glory of God alone. Well, let's take a look at the second temptation. It says that he was taken to a high place where he was showed all the kingdoms of the world. And what did the devil say? He said, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So, if you worship me, it will all be yours. Now I have a question for you. Was it really Satan's to give? Whose world is this, anyway? As I prepared this message and thought about what was happening here, I remembered the story of Robin Hood. You're all familiar with Robin Hood. Robin Hood lived during a time when Richard the Lionhearted, King Richard, was out of the country. And prior to leaving England, he had named Prince John as his regent his representative, to care for things as he would do. But what did John do? You may remember that Prince John was a wicked caretaker. And he rebelled against the authority of the rightful king. He seized power for himself. He abused Richard's subjects. And he did everything that he could to prevent 
the return of the rightful king. Well, that's kind of the way that the devil operates. God created this world for himself and as a home for people like you and I. But the devil has kind of moved in with the idea that he's taken it over. You know, Jesus said that the devil was a liar from the beginning. Don't be sucked in by his empty promises. Look again at Jesus' response. Jesus said, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The lesson here is this. You must never give greater importance to anyone or anything than what you give to God who created you. Because when you do, if you give greater importance to anything else, that thing becomes a false God to you. Like Jesus, you must never surrender the control of your life to anyone or anything other than God himself. Let's take a look at the third temptation. Jesus was taken to the highest point of the temple. And here again, the devil begins with that sneaky little word, if. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. Now i got to admit, that would not be much of a temptation for me. <laughs> that was a long way down. But Jesus knew that he could have done it. And the devil, this is really interesting, the devil starts quoting the Bible. He says to Jesus, it is written, he, that is God, will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Now that is a quote from the Psalm. In fact, it's a quote from Psalm 91, with which we began our service today. Wow, here you have the devil quoting the Bible. What's going on here? Is he suddenly saved or something? Not hardly, right? He is attempting to use a scripture out of context to manipulate Jesus into doing something that would not have pleased the Heavenly Father. And what is Jesus' response? He says... It says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Once again, he's quoting from the Torah, from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. You know, it is possible to quote scripture and to use scripture in a way that is contrary to what God wants. We have to be very careful in the handling of the scripture that we allow God's Spirit to apply it as it was intended to be done. There is a verse in the Bible that I think is very worth looking at at this point. It says, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. By the way, this is the theme verse for the Iwana program that our children participate in on Thursday nights. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. How important it is that we correctly handle this word of truth, this word of God. Before I share a message with you on Sunday morning, I always pray asking God to help me to handle his word correctly. Jesus models for us the correct way to handle the word of truth in order to overcome temptation. As I mentioned earlier, it is maybe helpful if we understand that there are three types of temptation that every human being must deal with in this life. If we want to give them labels, we can call them hedonism, materialism, and egoism. The Apostle John referred to these, the way that he expressed it is translated in the King James Version. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 
That's 1 John 2 and verse 16. Notice that the temptations of Jesus fall into these three categories. First of all, hedonism. What is that really? That is the cravings of our flesh. In our case, our sinful nature. Jesus did not have a sinful nature, but he was human just like us. Hedonism is a desire for pleasure greater than our desire for God. It is the temptation to gain pleasure from sinful activity. It may include things like sexual sins, gluttony, the overeating of food, drunkenness, the abuse of drugs. It may also include things like gossip, telling tales for our own gratification, hedonism, loving pleasure more than loving God. The second one is materialism, the lust of the eyes. That is where I see something and I want it. I've got to have it for myself. It kind of keeps you from appreciating things. You just want to possess them. I see something and I want it. I look at things that I shouldn't look at. And I want things that I shouldn't have. It's covetousness. Remember the Tenth Commandment? Thou shalt not covet. It's wanting what that other person has. You know, it's that desire to not only keep up with the Joneses, but to go one better. Wanting what the other person has because of its visual appeal. You remember the story of King David and Bathsheba? 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 3 says, One evening David got out of bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. That doesn't sound too bad so far, does it? From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. You may remember the story. Her husband was away serving in the military. David sends for the woman. He sleeps with her. He gets her pregnant. And eventually, he has her husband killed in order to cover up his wrongdoing. That's where covetousness can lead. And then, there's what we may term egoism. The pride of life. Pride is one of the sins that God hates most. It's boasting about what a person has and does. A desire for personal greatness and glory, showing off, needing to be the center of attention. At its core, it is selfishness. It's all about me. I evaluate every idea, plan, or project based on how it will affect me, right? What I will get out of it. So, what are the keys then to overcoming temptation? What? did Jesus do to overcome temptation? There are two things in this passage that I think come through loud and clear. Number one, the Word of God. Jesus used the Word of God to be able to stand against temptation. And secondly, the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God, which filled his very life. The Spirit of God, which led him every step of the way. The Word of God and the Spirit of God are always in agreement. The Spirit of God will never lead you contrary to the Word of God. The Spirit of God inspired the Word of God in the first place. If he contradicted it, he'd be contradicting himself. The Word and the Spirit. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was led by the Spirit, it says. When you are filled with God's Holy Spirit, then you have the spiritual resources within you to overcome temptation, to say no to that wrong thing. Jesus said, 
that the Father is more than willing to give His Spirit to those who ask Him. The Bible says that everyone who is a child of God has the Spirit of God, but it is possible to have the Spirit of God living within you and still not allow the Spirit of God to be the leader in your life. When God's Spirit is in control, when God's Spirit is leading you to live according to the precepts of God's Word in the Bible, that's when you have the power to say no to temptation. The Word of God and the Spirit of God. The Word of God applied by the Spirit of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. The Bible tells us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Perhaps some of you will recall that campfire song. If you want to see the devil run, shoot him down with the gospel gun. Well, that's the way it works. <laughs> a word of caution here. A victory over temptation today does not mean that you will not be tempted again in the future. Sometimes a temptation comes, you rely on God's Word and on God's Spirit, and you say no, and you don't do it. And you think, all right, I've got it beat now. And you let your guard down, and that temptation comes around again. I want you to notice a very key verse in the passage that we read together today. At the end of that passage, it says, When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left Jesus until an opportune time. This was not the last time Jesus was tempted. That sneaky enemy was going to come back again and again and again whenever he thought he saw an opportunity to cause Jesus to do wrong. And the devil and his demons operate the same way today. You think you've got that temptation overcome? Oh, I don't look at that stuff anymore. I don't drink that stuff anymore. I don't smoke that stuff anymore. I don't act out with other people's wives or with people that I'm not married to in the way that I once did. I've got my, my life under control now. And the moment you think that you've got it all easy street, the devil comes back and looks for another opportune time to tempt you and cause you When you're tempted, remember what it cost Jesus to deal with your sin. He sacrificed his body. He shed his life blood so that you could be free from sin. So that you could not only be forgiven, but that you could live in victory over sin. He gave himself. He loves you that much. Today, however much of a mess you may have made of your life by giving in to temptations of one kind or another, I want to encourage you, give God your mess and he will transform it into a message. That's our God. That's our Savior. That's the spirit that we have in Him. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you that Jesus overcame temptation. Thank you that He was victorious over the temptations of the devil because He stood on your word and applied it as led and filled by your Holy Spirit. May we follow the example of Jesus. But more than that, we know that we need the Spirit of Jesus in order to overcome the temptations that come our way in this life. You know where we are weak, and we are all weak. 
but you make us strong. It is your spirit that makes us strong. And it is only when we recognize our own human weakness and rely on the power of your spirit that we can live lives of victory. May that be our experience today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time I'm going to ask Marv and Cheryl and Arlen and Laura Lee to come and join me here at the table of communion. <coughs> our worship team will take their place. <coughs>